morning, children of God, and welcome to Sunday School. My name is Nessie, and I'm going to be your teacher for today. So, today's lesson comes from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Does anyone have any idea what those verses are talking about? Well, if you don't know, I'm going to fill you in. So these verses are about the parable of the Good Samaritan. And before we get into the parable of the Good Samaritan or the story of the Good Samaritan, I just want to talk to you quickly about one thing that my mother asked me to do. So my mom asked me to pick out some things that I would want for lunch and to pack them up for for a meal for my lunchtime. But for some very strange and odd reason, She just doesn't seem to agree with anything that I've chosen. So I would like for you to help me look at what I've decided I like and the snacks that I've packed for my lunch and tell me what could be the reason that she doesn't like any of the stuff I've picked out. Okay, let's take a look into my lunchbox. All right, so let's take a look into this lunchbox, shall we? So I have here some of my favorite things. And I mean, I really don't know why she didn't approve of any of them. As you guys can see or are are looking with me in my lunchbox, we've got some, mm, we've got here some Oreos for the biscuits. Then we've got some chip nicks, my favorite, my favorite chips. And of course, we have to have a chocolate snack. So, a Kit Kat, Kit Kat Chunky. Of course, it's the only option. For the main meal, we've got a sausage roll. Perfect, right? Just absolutely perfect. And then, of course... We can't forget the donuts, you guys. I have the most perfect donuts. And then last but not least, we have to have something to wash all of this down. So how about a lemon twist? Perfect, right? Yeah, I think so. But like I said, my mother doesn't seem to think that it is perfect apparently all of these things that I like and that I seem to think are delicious she doesn't approve of instead she wants me to have a more balanced and healthy meal and she wants me to put things in like like cucumbers and and carrots and and a banana oh man look at the sandwich you guys it's got all of these green things and look at the bread it's just it's 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 so healthy oh of course how could i forget she also packed for me these crackers and nuts and strawberries and it's just fruits and fruits and fruits and healthy food and of course do you know what she wants me to wash all of this already healthy food down yep you guessed it h2o good old water guys so from analyzing or looking at what I would like to put in my lunchbox and what my mother thinks is the right thing or I should have in my lunchbox being more healthy foods. I mean, looking at them, I can understand those things are okay, you know, but why do I need them to, why do I need to have them in my lunch? 
Why can't I just have these treats that I would like to enjoy? So it might sound strange to think of it this way, but sometimes this is our attitude when it comes to caring for other people. We tend to want to hang out with only our best friends and with the people that we like the best. We might want to love and serve those only who are close to us and those we know very, very well, like good friends and family. But if we do that, then we don't always think about caring for those who we don't know so well, or maybe even people who are not kind to us in return. Does God really want us to love them too? Well, there's a passage in the Bible, like I told you, um, from Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 37, where Jesus answers the question of, who is my neighbor? Jesus provides a parable, which is a story to help us understand what he meant. And in this parable, there was a man on the road heading from Jerusalem all the way to Jericho. Now, kids, you must understand, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was a very dangerous road in Jesus' times. It was a road where people met with many accidents, a road where people um, were prone to getting robbed um, or being victim to some kind of crime. So... As a testament to this, this man on the on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho was robbed and beaten and he was take all of his money was taken from him. And after he had been robbed and beaten, he was left on the side of the road for dead. Well, as he lay there, a priest who worked for the church happened to come along by walking and he saw this man. Now, you would think someone who worked in a church would stop to give this man a hand, right? Well, no, he did not, not at all. That priest, that priest didn't want to get himself dirty or waste his time helping out someone that he didn't even know. So the priest rode on by and walked right past the man who was lying on the side of the road. He walked past him like he hadn't even seen him. And after the priest had come by, then a Levite came by. Levites were also important and special people and they too were well respected in those times as they were people who worked in the temple. They followed the law and prided themselves in their righteousness and their goodness. So do you then think that the Levite stopped to help this man? Well, we would have hoped so, right? But the reality is no. The Levite also, just like the priest, did not stop. He rode right past that man lying on the side of the road. He could see he was injured. He could see he was hurt and that he needed assistance or he needed some kind of help, but he chose not to help him. Well, after all of this, then a Samaritan came along. Samaritan people in these olden times were not very well liked by the Jews of Jesus' time. It's hard to describe exactly why, but they disagreed on some of the things, on some things, and were considered um, to be unclean outsiders. Of all the people that walked past this man, from the priest who was well-respected and um, has the respect of many people, to the Levite, who once again is also well-respected in the community for the job that they do, to now the Samaritan, of those three people, 
you would have expected at least the priest or the Levite to assist, not the social outcast, not the person who is thought of as unclean and not worthy to stop and help. But do you want to know exactly what happened? That's what the Samaritan did. He didn't even waste a minute. He stopped and he helped the poor, beaten, hurt man. He got dirty and he patched him up. He put him on his own donkey. He got off his donkey and put this man on the donkey and took him to the nearest hotel to get him taken care of. Talk about the least expected thing happening. So what was the point of the story that Jesus told? Jesus wanted to reveal to the people that he was speaking to that day that our neighbor is not just the person closest to you or the one who lives nearby or the one you know and care for the most. God wants us to love and care for everyone because he loves and cares for everyone. Remember John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God did not choose which people he would save or which people he loves. God loves everyone, regardless of who they are, where they come from, what they believe in. God loves them regardless because we are all his children and we are all made in his image. The Good Samaritan in the story is not just a random person, but is an example of Jesus Christ himself, who gave his life for all of us and was willing to love us in all of our messiness and in all of our sin. Because remember, my friends, we are not clean. We are not pure. We have all sinned in one way or another. And the one thing that Jesus also doesn't do is measure our sin against one another. He doesn't say, oh, okay, because you have sinned so much and you have sinned so much, I'm going to treat you this way and I'm going to treat you this way. No, Jesus doesn't pick. He's not choosy. He treats us all the same. Jesus showed us his love and sacrificed for us, for all of us. So he wants us to love God and to love others. Not only should we love our family and friends, but we should treat all people with care, love, respect, and dignity. Even if they are not the closest to us, or even if they are not very nice to us. Trust me, friends, it is not always easy to follow the godly way or the Christ-like way and, and to love everyone. There might be people who make it difficult to love them. And maybe there are people who are not always kind. We don't have to purposely let people do mean and hurtful things to us just in the name of because this is what Jesus would do or this is what Jesus would want me to do. But it is important to pray for others if they are a mean person or a hurtful person and realize that all of us are made in God's image and that hopefully through our prayer, that person will one day realize their ways and turn around, you know, and change their ways. We can say kind words to, to, to others to show them love. And we can ask God to help us show love to others and ask for opportunities to, to do exactly that, to show love to other people and to express to other people that we love God and express our, pre, our, our appreciation for God's love. So that would bring us to the end of our story today. And why don't we take this moment right now to say, to say a short prayer, to thank God for loving us and for us to always remember that 
our neighbor isn't necessarily the person across the road from us, our mom, our dad, our brother, our cousin, our best friend at school. It's everyone on this earth. And the most important thing to do, of course, is to treat everyone with God's love. All right, kids, let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God, thank you for caring for us and loving us no matter what. Help us to share your love and grace and to care for all of your people, even those who are harder to love. Thank you for your love. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Alrighty, kids. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. See you next time. Bye. Good morning and welcome to everyone. This is the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. You are welcome if you are joining us for the first time. We are hoping that you will be enjoying this service with us this morning. Please feel free to share with others so that they can also join us uh, when they are able to. Uh, the subscription to the channel allows you to be able to continue to watch other content or even watch the service afterwards. So if there are any things that you think your friends and family can benefit from, please share it with them so that they too can uh, watch our service and be able to benefit from it. Uh, before we go into the service, I just want to make one or two announcements. Uh, the first announcement I just want to make is to thank everyone who attended the marriage seminar last week at Aruka. Thank you very much. I understand that it went very well and the couples that were there enjoyed themselves. So we hope that uh, um, when we have the next one, uh, more people will also be able to attend. Uh, secondly, we have gone past the first half of the year. We are now in the second half. We are counting down to the end of 2022. That's how fast time is moving. Uh, I just wanted to give you an update on our, the status of our income as the church. Um, the first six months of the year, uh, we have mixed bag of results. Uh, nine of our churches are showing an average of about 16-17% uh, uh, increase on 2021 income. That's very good. But another 8% of our churches are showing about 15% uh, less income than 2021. Uh, uh, and so... We have this mixed bag and therefore the overall income when all these are put together is about 1.7%. That's 1.6%. That's how much uh, the overall income is compared to last year. So we're still way below uh, the inflation, which is over 6% at the moment. So we're hoping that uh, the nine churches uh, where the income is about 16% higher than last year will continue to carry that through. And that the ones, the bottom 8%, uh, the eight churches whose income is... 15% below last year, we'll start seeing a turnaround and maybe towards the end of the year, the income will normalize. But once again, thank you very much to all those of you who continue to give so generously that we can see in these nine churches across the country where the income is 16, 17% higher than last year. That's like two or three times uh, the inflation that we are seeing. So thank you once again. I know that there are some who have started giving, uh, who are not giving the in the past, and I know that there are some who, uh, as they get increases each year, they increase their giving according to how God is blessing them. So once again, thank you very much for those that continue to do that. So please remember to like the service, remember to subscribe to the channel, um, and we're going to go uh, following the same uh, program we follow each week. Uh, we'll go into the service with an opening prayer, which will be then be followed by the worship songs, and then we'll have the speaking of life video, followed by the giving message, and then we'll have the a last song and then the blessing at the end. So let's go into the service. We'll start with the opening prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you so much for the gift of life. We thank you, Lord, that you were with us throughout this whole week till today, till we're able to have this beautiful opportunity to get together to learn more about your everlasting love for us. We pray that as we're going to hear your word and sing praises to you, be with us, Lord. Open up our hearts and minds to grasp whatever message it is that you want us to take in today. We thank you so much for this. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The Bible says it's a good thing to give thanks to the Lord. Amen.
I come before you today There's just one thing that I want to say Thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord For all you've given to me Blessings that I cannot see. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. With a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm, I will bless your name. and gave me your light. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You took my sin and my shame. You took my sickness and healed all my pain. Why?
Aristotle is quoted as saying, nature abhors a vacuum. He was one of the first to observe that on Earth, there are no natural occurring spaces where nothing exists. The moment that a vacuum or empty space begins to develop, some form of matter will quickly fill it. You have seen this law of nature in action whenever you open a vacuum sealed jar. You hear the pop of air rushing in when you open it. This natural phenomenon says something about God. Out of His abundant goodness, He wants to fill all of creation with something of Himself. This includes us, those made in His image. God wants to fill us with everything that Jesus is. Unfortunately, all of us have things that get in the way. Bad habits, impure motives, selfish desires, and other manifestations of sin. These are the things that interrupt our relationship with God and negatively impact our relationship with others. God does not address sin by creating vacuums. Rather, He fills us with the heart and mind of Christ so there is no longer room for sinful things. It is Christ living in us that allows us to love God and love others. In his letter to the Colossian church, Paul had to address false teachings that was infecting the Christian community. Instead of simply calling for the heresy to be removed, he prayed for the believers to be filled. Notice what he said. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of His holy people in the kingdom of light. When we consider our own spiritual health, it is natural to focus on the things we want to change. We may ask God to remove our sinful tendencies without giving much thought to what we would like to see take up that space. In those moments, it is important to remember that God wants to fill that space, that vacuum, with Himself. His desire is to fill us with His love and His life that we can share with others. Because of His grace, we can look forward to the day when sin will be no more, because everything and everyone will be completely filled by Jesus. Mi nombre es Everticas hablando de vida. Greetings in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. My name is Mary Kashani Mujaji Branch Limpopo. This is how God loves us so much by laying down his only begotten son, Christ, for our lives. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters who are in need. If anyone has a material possession and see a brother or a sister who are in need and has no pity on them, how can the love of God be on that person? Let us not love with speech or in weight, but we must love in action and in truth. Acts 20, chapter 35 says, In everything I did, showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 18, verse 16, it says, And 
Do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifice, God is pleased. God is pleased when we give others who are in need. In the book of Proverbs chapter 11 verse 25, it says, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. God needs a cheerful giver. Let's try God by doing good to others and see him pouring us the floodgates of heaven. Give generously and bless it abundantly. God loves you. Amen. once again. Today we find that our text is one of those very familiar stories that Jesus told. And um, sometimes some of these stories, because they are so familiar, we tend to read them too quickly and maybe, maybe make wrong conclusions about what they are about. So today we are going to talk about the story of the Good Samaritan, as it has been told before. It's a story that we're all familiar with, but we're going to go through it so that we can tease out what we believe Jesus is actually trying to tell us in this story. And I want us not to forget where we were last week. Last week, we were in Luke chapter 10 in the early chapters, in the early verses, where Jesus appointed the 72 and sent them out to preach. And uh, this is while he's on the way to Jerusalem. We said that Jesus has set his mind to get to Jerusalem where he was going to be arrested and killed. And so we find today's story in that context, in that context and in that background. That's where Luke puts this story. So when we go through it today, I want you to see that in fact maybe the story of the Good Samaritan has been misinterpreted before. Perhaps there is a better way to understand this story than the traditional view that we have been told. Firstly, this story is not a parable, so Jesus doesn't say it is a parable. But it might well be a story, whether it happened or not, we don't know. Sometimes teachers can create stories to make the point, but this is not necessarily in the form of a parable. So when you go into the details, don't be carried away with the details because sometimes that's what we do and we end up misunderstanding what is being said. So go with me to the book of Luke chapter 10 because that's where we find our passage for today and we'll start in verse 25. And I'm just going to, in the first part, go through the story itself and then we'll try to say what is Jesus trying to tell us by this story. Okay, Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. 
He says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, so you know that Jesus has been um, tested and challenged many times by Pharisees. Now, this time, one of the experts of the law, this like, if it was today, we we'll probably have said he was the professor of the Torah, professor of the law. He knew his law very well. Probably he knew it better than the priests and the Levites. That's how knowledgeable this man is. So he comes to Jesus, probably hoping that if Jesus doesn't know the answer to this, he will discredit him because it will mean that Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. He can't speak about the law if he doesn't know the law itself. And so this is what this man says in chapter in verse 25. He ask, comes to Jesus and he asks him a question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? So that's a critical question. We'll come back to this question. What should we do today to get eternal life, to receive eternal life? Then it goes in, chapter, in verse 26. Jesus answers. And as often Jesus does, he asks the question with a question. Okay? He says in verse 26, what is written in the law? Okay? The law that you claim to know so well, what does it say? Why are you asking me that? How do you read it? He says. Verse 27, he answered, the law says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. So, it was very clear that this man knows his law. It goes exactly to the heart of the law that Jesus himself taught. And then in verse 28, Jesus says, you have answered correctly. So Jesus affirms the guy. He says, your answer is perfect. He says, do that and you will have eternal life. Do that and you will have eternal life. But of course, people like him, as Jesus always rebuked and reprimanded them, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, is that although they knew the law so well, they did not practice it. Okay? So he knows that Jesus by then say, but you don't practice that. So to justify himself, it says uh, in verse 29, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now this is clearly an expert in the law. Even today, lawyers are those kind of people who they try to argue around a word. Okay? They make a whole case in the courts because they want to use a word to discredit their opponent's case. And this is what this man wants to do. He wants to use the word neighbor to say, who then is my neighbor? Okay? Because how do you define that? Because the way you define neighbor might determine how then do you get eternal life? How then do you inherit eternal life? Okay? So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Because he wanted to justify himself. He wanted to feel better about himself because he knows he's actually not looking after his neighbor. And then in verse 30, Jesus replies. So in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So Jesus then begins to tell the story what, that we have come to know as the story of the Good Samaritan. So he says, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. It is said that the road uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho was a treacherous road. It was a dangerous road. You remember those days there was no cars, so people used to either go with donkeys uh, walk um, or camels, whatever the case may be. So it was a dangerous road to walk and also because of its danger, the robbers used to hide amongst the rocks, behind the rocks and attack the passers-by if they see somebody who has what they are looking for. So it was a dangerous road and people who are listening to Jesus are probably familiar with this road. So when Jesus says a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he was attacked by robbers, Many probably are familiar with people who have been attacked by robbers on that road. So they know that road, you don't travel alone. 
because if you do, you are likely to be attacked by robbers. Jesus says they stripped this man of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. So it appears this man didn't have anything that these guys needed to take from him. Because they beat him up, they take off his clothes. We don't know why they're taking his clothes because they want to his clothes or they are taking his clothes just to shame him and embarrass him. We don't know. But they take away his clothes, they beat him up and leave, leave him for dead. And then in verse 31, it says, A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So a priest comes along and he sees that man in front of him down the road, probably 100 meters, 200 meters ahead of him. He sees that's a man who has been injured, um, is probably dying or is probably dead because they say he was half dead. And maybe the priest didn't want to touch a dead body because he would be defied if he did that. So it says he went, he took another road. Okay? And then Jesus continues. So too a Levite. Now a Levite is also people who minister to the ministry of God in the temples. He says when he came to the place and saw the man, he passed by on the other side as well. Okay? So the priest and the Levite, they see the man down the road. Instead of going to where the man was, they take a detour and go past him. They don't want to deal with this man. They don't want to help this man who has been left half dead. I don't know whether you, you have ever noticed. I always try to check the behavior of people when you get to traffic lights at the robots and you are waiting in the robots and there are people who are begging. Okay? There might be one guy with a board coming to the windows of the cars. So you'll find that when people are coming to the four-way stop, and they see the beggar on this lane. They change the lane. They go to the other side. They avoid him. Even when they get too close where he is, if they can't run away, they avoid contact, eye contact with him. They don't want to deal with him. This is what proverbially is happening with the Levite and the Pharisee. They don't want to, they don't want to look the guy in the, in the eye. They don't want to deal with these issues. They want to just get on on their journey. Then in verse 33, Jesus then gives the audience a shocker. He says, but a Samaritan, okay, so we can assume that this man who was half dead, who was beaten by the robbers, was probably a Jew. And the two Jewish men, religious men, who came across him, they didn't help him. And yet Jesus says in verse 33, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, he came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and he brought him to an inn and took care of him. Then next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. What a different response from this Samaritan. A man that this expert of the law probably looks down on. He probably looks up on the, on the, on the priest and the Levite. And yet those are the people who neglected and avoided to deal with the injured man. And the Samaritan was probably despised by this expert is the one who stops. It says he took pity on that man. What does it mean? Does it mean the priest and the liver did not have pity on the man? Possibly. That's why they could walk away on the other side of the road and not have to deal with him. But the Samaritan man could not avoid this because when he saw the man, he felt pity for him and he went to him and he bandaged his wound. Now, does this man carry a first aid kit with him. We don't know. Chances are he took some of his own clothes. He tore his own clothes to bandage this man. This is what he does. Okay? Because I don't think he actually walks around with a first aid kit with bandages and stuff like that. But let's assume he does. Maybe he does. Because he was with a donkey that he was uh, riding on. So maybe he did carry that. But he took out his bandages 
and he bandaged this man. He poured oil and wine on the wounds and helped this man. Then he put him, the man, on his own donkey. Okay, chances are up to that point. He was riding on the donkey. Now he has to put this man on the donkey and probably he walks now. He walks in front of the donkey while this donkey is carrying this injured man. And then he, brought him, he, brings, he brings him to an inn and took care of him. So he says the next, the next day he took her to dinner. So what does it mean if he says the next day? It means that that night, he spent the night, he probably went to the hotel and inn is a hotel, a lodge, whatever you want to call it, a guest house. So he booked into a guest house and he goes in with this injured man. And the whole night he looks after this man. And the following morning, the next day in verse 35, the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. He says to him, look after him and say, and he said, when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. So the next day, after spending the whole night looking after this man, he, give, he hands him over to the innkeeper, to the hotel manager or the lodge manager and say, please look after this patient for me. When I come back, any expenses you have incurred, the food you have given him, the oil you have used to, to, to treat his wounds, just write them down and when I come back, I will pay you. He gives this man a blank check to look after this injured man. And once again, it's a stranger he doesn't know. It's somebody that he found on the road and he's helping in this way. So what you can see here is that the Samaritan man goes completely out of his way to help this man who has been injured. He goes, he spares no expense. Okay? He spends his time on this man. He spends money and even more money on this man. That is the extent to which the Samaritan man went. That's why today we call it the Good Samaritan. Because that is what we see in his behavior. In verse 36, then Jesus, after telling this story, turns to the expert of the law. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Which of these three men, the priest, when, when he saw the man, he took the other route, and the Levite, when he saw the man, he took the other route, and the Samaritan who stopped and went out of his way to help this man. Which one, Jesus asks, was a neighbor to the man? And then in 37, the expert in the law replied, though the one who had mercy on him, and Jesus told him, you go and do likewise. Okay? So all of us, if, as we, we ask that question, we, it is very clear in the story that the good Samaritan, the Samaritan guy, is the one who showed, who behaved like the neighbor to this guy. So firstly, we see that the neighbor here is described not as somebody who lives next door to you, not somebody who is living next to, your, to you on the chair next to you. The neighbor in this context, in this story, is anybody you come across becomes your neighbor. Anybody you come across becomes your neighbor, more so if they are in need. They become your neighbor. So what does this story tell us? What is this story about? And I think this is where we fall off the bus in trying to understand this story. It's important that we go back and understand why did Jesus tell this story? Why was he telling the story? We need to go back to the beginning of the story in verse 25 because there is a particular question that Jesus is trying to answer. Okay? In verse 25, it says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus is trying to answer the question, What must you do to, to inherit eternal life? And often, most people have then read that question. They went through the story and then they say, oh, okay, so the story is about getting eternal life. And therefore, if you behave like the good Samaritan, then you get eternal life. 
That's how you get eternal life. But that's not true. What is the biblical answer to the question how to inherit eternal life? How do we inherit eternal life? How do we inherit eternal life? Well, the Bible is very clear. In John chapter 3, verse 16, it's a verse that we are familiar with. It gives us the answer to that question. How do you get eternal life? John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So to get eternal life, you believe in Jesus. That's the answer. That's the biblical answer. Okay? So the biblical answer is not works. It's not what you do as this man was saying. Okay? In Acts chapter 16 verse 31, you'll remember the story of Timothy uh, uh, and Paul and Silas uh, and specifically Paul and Silas in the jail. Okay? In Acts 16 verse 31, Let's start in verse 28, 29. It says, The jailer called for lights and rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Says, What must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Okay? So the biblical answer to the question, What must I do to inherit eternal life? is believe in Jesus. So what is the answer to the question that the expert of the law asked? What must I do to inherit an eternal life? The answer is believe in Jesus. Jesus is the answer. So in the story that Jesus told, the story of the Good Samaritan, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus in the story? Many say the Good Samaritan represents Jesus. But I think that actually misses the point. Remember we said that this story is being told in the context where Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem, where he is going to be arrested and killed. Okay? So I think Jesus in this story is not the Good Samaritan. Jesus in this story is the man who is attacked and left half dead. He is the one who represents Jesus in the story. He is the one who is attacked. Okay? Because when he gets to Jerusalem, in fact, that's what happens to him. He gets attacked and is left for dead. Okay? Remember when Jesus um, was crucified? Okay? In the same book of Luke, Luke chapter 24, later after Jesus, um, uh, Luke, sorry, Luke chapter 23, after Jesus uh, had died, it says in verse uh, 50 of Luke 23. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man. I want to see you to notice how he is described. Okay? A good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. So he did not agree with the killing of Jesus. So he came from Judea, the Judean town of Armatia, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. He went to Pilate. He asked for Jesus' body. And in verse 53, it says, Then he took it down. What did he do when he took the bloodied body of Jesus, who was dead? What did he do? Okay. It says in verse 53, He took Jesus' body down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet, had yet been laid. Okay. So Joseph of Arimathea behaves like the good Samaritan towards Jesus who has been crucified, whose body is full of blood, who is dead. He takes his body and he wraps it in cloth, linen cloth, just like the good Samaritan does when he finds the man beaten and left half dead. He wraps him with bandages and he takes him to the inn. Joseph Aramathia takes Jesus to the tomb, a tomb that was new, that was hewn out of a rock. That was very expensive because you need to do that. You need somebody who goes to the mountain and chisel out a rock and create a, a, a tomb on the rock. That's how that, that, that uh, uh, tomb was made. And nobody was ever buried in it. It was a brand new uh, cave, cave, a brand new tomb. 
So Arimathea spends his money and time to bury Jesus, to look after Jesus who has been killed. Just like the good Samaritan takes after, to look after this man who has been beaten and left half dead. So Jesus, in the story, is the man who has been beaten and left half dead. Because that's what happens to him when he gets to Jerusalem. And the people who respond to the crucified Jesus are the good Samaritans. The people who respond by believing in this Jesus who has been left half dead are the good Samaritans. In fact, in Matthew chapter 25, Matthew chapter 25, you are familiar with the story uh, from verse 35 to 40, where Jesus was talking about what he's going to do when he separates the sheep and the goats. Let's read from verse 35. He says to them, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. This is what the Samaritan, good Samaritan does to this man. He gives him clothes, and he was sick, and he takes him in, and he looks after him. And he says, I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? Then the king will reply in verse 40, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So Jesus identifies with those without clothes, with those who are sick, with those who are in prison, with those who are beaten up by robbers and left for dead. Jesus says, that's me. If you look after such people, if you feel, if you have pity on such people, then you are my disciples. Okay? So Jesus is the man who was beaten and left for dead. He is the crucified man in the story. The one that the good Samaritan comes and looks after. And that's where you and I come in. We are called to inherit in life is to believe in this man. This man who has been beaten and crucified for us. That's the man we believe in. That's the man that has been given for us for our salvation. That's what this story is telling us. Jesus is not the good Samaritan. The good Samaritan is a disciple of Jesus who looks after the sick, who looks after the destitute, who looks after the hungry, who looks after the, in, the, the ones who are in, in prison. That's a good disciple. Okay? The one who believes in Jesus. And today, we still live in the same situation where we are confronted with having to look after Jesus. And how do we look after Jesus? By taking care of those that he described in Matthew 25. That when you look after a man who has been beaten and left for dead, you are doing that to me. When you help a beggar at the traffic lights, you are doing that for me. When you help somebody with clothes who doesn't have clothes, you are doing that for me. That's how the disciples of Jesus are identified. And those who believe in Jesus, those disciples of Jesus, are the ones who inherit eternal life. So the answer to the question that the expert of the law asked is not to say, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Because the answer, as we know from the scriptures, is that we must believe in Jesus. And Jesus says, those who believe in me, take care of those that are destitute and in need because I come through those people. So when you see somebody at the traffic lights begging, that person represents Jesus. So whatever you do for that person, you are doing it for Jesus. The man took a lot of risk on his own life. How do you know that they, how do you know that the robbers are not still around? And then they'll attack him as well. And it sounds like because he had a donkey, he probably had a lot of stuff that he was carrying with him. He was a better target to be attacked by the robbers. And yet, he doesn't think of himself. He was not self-absorbed. He thinks about the man who has been left half dead. 
and he goes down on his knees, he bandages him, he puts him on his donkey, and he takes him with him, he looks him after him overnight. And the following day, he hands him over to another person, and he carries the cost of all of that. And that is what us, as the disciples of Jesus, are called to do. We are called to do that. We are called to endure the inconvenience of having to look after people who are not well. The inconvenience of having to spend our own money to do that. So when we make our offerings to the church, when we make our donations to help people who are in need, we are behaving like the good disciple that Jesus described here, who happened to be a Samaritan. And Jesus is making a very powerful point that perhaps the disciples of Jesus, the true disciples of Jesus, the true believers in Jesus are not the ones that you normally would think about. You know, I sometimes wonder if I were to stand at the traffic lights and I watch people's reaction to the beggar and the robots and see who helps him and who doesn't help him. And I went to find out which of these people who actually help this man are Christians and which ones are not. What do you think we'll find? I shudder to think what we'll find. Because chances are the Christians, when they look at the beggar in the tra traffic lights, he's dirty and he's smelling and he's probably high on drugs or drunk. We tend to judge them and say, no, I'm not going to waste my money on this drunkard. We change the lanes or we go, we look away and we go past. And probably other people that we look down on who are not Christians, the good Samaritans are the ones who stop. And I think in this story, Jesus is challenging us. He's saying, if you want to be my disciple, if you, want to be, if you say you believe in me, then care about those that I care about. Care about those, those people who are in need. And caring about them does mean that you'll experience inconvenience. You'll experience personal cost to yourself to do that. And those are the ones that Jesus is telling us to be like. So the story is about how do we need eternal life and it's about believing in Jesus and doing what he will do. Saving those that he will save. Because when we serve them, we serve him. That's what I believe this story is about. Let's go and be the good disciples, the good Samaritans that Jesus is asking us to be. Because when we do that, it shows that we believe in him who was attacked by the thieves. Remember Jesus when he was attacked in Jerusalem and he was crucified. He was crucified amongst thieves. Okay? He was crucified among the thieves. So the whole story shows that Jesus, in fact, is the man who has been beaten and left for dead. And those that go out of their way to look after this man are the disciples of Jesus. Those are the ones that will inherit eternal life. Because they believe in the crucified, the one who has been attacked by the, by the thieves, by the robbers, and left for dead. Let's be like Joseph of Arimathea, who takes this bloodied body of Jesus and wrap it and place it away in his own expensive tomb. Let's be like the good Samaritan, who finds this beaten up Jesus and takes him to an inn and takes care of him. Let's be like the good Samaritan, who takes the church of Jesus and look after it. And look after the members, the brothers and sisters of Jesus who are in the church. And even the people who I need in our communities. Let's be the kind of people that Jesus is describing in this picture of this Samaritan man. Because those, Jesus says, are the true disciples of Jesus. The ones who are willing to take up their cross and follow Jesus. The ones who are willing to experience inconvenience to look after Jesus who has been left out dead. Grace to you. Let's go out and be these great disciples who are like this Samaritan man. Amen.
was rich I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time Sin separated The breach was far too wide But from the far side of the chasm You held me in your sight so you made a way across the great divide Left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside And there at the cross you paid the debt I owe Broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time I into glorious life You took my place laid inside my tomb of sin You were buried for three days but then you walked right out again and now death
church receive the blessing. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen.
All the breath, the length, the depth, and the height of the love of God. Oh, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God. We who were once afar off, you have brought near by the blood of Jesus. Thank you. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what great a salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 